Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from OnlinePhotographyTraining.com. Welcome to my video series, Mastering the Nick Collection. Several years ago, the Nick Collection of plugins was the number one set of plugins for Photoshop and Lightroom. Cashing in on their success, they sold off to Google. Google marketed the suite for a couple years with a few updates. Then they announced that they would not be updating the software any longer, and they made it free to download. Around that time, I did a set of training videos on the software that proved to be very popular. Recently, the company DxO purchased the rights to the Nick Collection and announced that they would be developing and updating it. Although it's no longer free, it is nice to have a caretaker for this software because it is very good. With all the good things happening with Nick, I decided to update my training videos on the product. This new series will be more in-depth and thorough than the previous series. Please be aware that I have no affiliation with the company, I'm not being paid by them to do these videos, and if you purchase the software, I will not be making a commission on the sale. With that said, if you could do me a favor, if you like these videos, please click the thumbs up button and share them. Finally, if you can make a donation, I would greatly appreciate it. That info is in the description below this video, along with a link to my code of ethics statement. Let's get started. In this episode, we're going to use Silver Effects Pro 2 as a Photoshop plugin. Also, I'm going to demonstrate the tools that are included in Silver Effects Pro 2 that allow you to apply the zone mapping system to your monochrome image. Now, as you can see, I have this image. It's in Photoshop. I just did some basic adjustments um, to the RAW file, and now it's in Photoshop. And I want to send it over into Silver Effects Pro 2. Before I do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it uh, into a smart object. When you convert an image for in Photoshop into or, or a layer in Photoshop into a smart object, the Nick plugin you'll be using will become a smart filter. And what that means is you'll be able to go back in after you close down, in this case, Silver Effects Pro 2, return back into Photoshop. If you decide, oh, I forgot to adjust something in the image, you'll be able to jump back into Silver Effects Pro 2 and it will remember all the things you've done to the image and all your settings and you'll be able to readjust something or adjust something new. So I'm going to convert this layer into a smart object by right clicking on it and I'll go down to convert to smart object and it will just take a second to do and once it does you'll notice the little postage stamp uh, picture in the corner will have a square and that will indicate that the background layer is now a smart layer and it like there it goes right there we have that little square so we're all set. Now I'm ready to send it into Silver Effects Pro 2. I'll go up to Filter, down to Nick Collection, and down to Silver Effects Pro 2. When it opens in Silver Effects Pro 2, I'll get a dialog box telling me that you just sent over a smart object. So Silver Effects Pro 2 is now going to act as a smart filter. It's also mentioning that the brush button is deactivated. You may remember in my Color Effects Pro 4 videos, when I sent an image uh, from Photoshop into Color Effects Pro 4, we had an extra button down here, a brush button. I don't think I really adequately, adequately demonstrated how to use that button. So I'm going to do one more video after this video on Silver Effects Pro 2, and I'm going to specifically demo that brush button a little more thoroughly uh, so that you could better understand how it works in a Nick plugin. And again, that brush button only appears when you use the Nick plugin as a Photoshop plugin, and it will only appear when you're not using a smart layer or smart object as I am now. So it's not there. So we'll talk about that more thoroughly in our next video. So I'm going to click OK, and it opens the image. And as I mentioned in the other videos, as soon as you open an image in Silver Effects Pro 2, it applies this first preset, this triple zero neutral preset to your image. 
Now, usually, and I mentioned that I like to come in and pick a preset and then work off the preset, meaning the preset's going to get me close to what I like, and then I'll go over and adjust things to my taste. And for this demonstration, I think I'm just going to go to high structure harsh. Maybe it's a little too much structure really for my taste, but I'm going to leave it at that for now because really what I want to talk about is the zone mapping system and the tools that are included in SilverFX Pro 2 to use the zone mapping system. Now, those of you not familiar with the zone mapping system, it was developed, I think, in the early 40s uh, by Ansel Adams and Fred Archer, two you know, super famous photographers. And the reason being, or the idea here, is when they went out and they were mainly photographing landscapes, they would try to visualize the scene in their mind as a monochrome image. And they try to determine what the darkest parts of the image were and what the brightest parts of the image were and where the image kind of uh, skewed. Meaning, did you have more bright areas compared to the dark areas or did you have more dark areas compared to the light areas? And what they're doing this for is they're trying to figure out their exposure because it was very easy, especially in those early days, of you know photography to expose the image in such a way that when you developed it you either crushed the blacks you had no detail in the blacks at all or you just blew out the highlights and you had no detail in the highlights nowadays the zone system zone mapping system isn't used as much because our cameras have such our digital cameras have such great exposure latitude that it's hard to make a mistake you could underexpose an image by several stops and recover all that shadow detail and vice versa. You could overexpose it by several stops and recover some highlight detail. But in that early days of film, and even the newer film nowadays has a lot more exposure latitude, but in those early days of film, especially the film they used, usually used black and white sheet film. And they had to be very careful with black and white sheet film. And a little later, the early black and white negative film, uh, that they exposed it so that the blacks were not crushed. And they really used to expose for the shadows and develop for the highlights. Later on, uh, I, when I was really into film photography, when I first started out, we're talking in the early 80s, um, film chemistry was such that you didn't worry about it as much. Although for a lot of my clients, I had to shoot slide film. That's positive film. And that's kind of the opposite. You had to worry about the highlights getting blown out. So you would expose for the highlights and develop for the shadows. And digital photography is a little more like that, meaning we have to be very conscious of the highlights when we expose. We have a little more grace with the um, shadows. We could make a mistake underexposing an image and recover much of that detail in the shadows. But if we overexpose an image, we really risk losing the detail in the highlights. So with that said, that's your two minute, three minute uh, explanation of the zone mapping system. I encourage you to look it up so you could get a better explanation from uh, someone who's more versed in it than I am. But as far as applying it to an image, when you're in Silver Effects Pro, if you look over at the right hand panel, you'll see this loop and histogram. And you'll see along the bottom, there's these little boxes from zero all the way up to 10. That's the map, the zones that Fred Archer and Ansel Adams developed they, these 11 zones. Zero are blacks. The blacks in the scene are zero. The whites in the scene are 10. And you can see that as we go through, the zero is the blacks. And if I hover over zero, you'll notice that I'm getting this kind of grid pattern over here on the left-hand side of the image. That's telling me that those are those black tones. As I move to the right, you'll see that I'll get other parts of the image, uh, get that kind of uh, diagonal slash added to it. And as I keep moving to the right, you'll see that the mid-tones now are starting to show it up in the sky, now the clouds, and we go on and on and on as we go through. Now, usually, if you're just sharing an image online, it doesn't matter quite as much if you have uh, highlights, let's say, that are blown out, um, as long as it's not like most of the image. And it won't matter if you have uh, shadows that are crushed, because eh, looking at the computer screen, it's not that big of a deal. 
If you're going to print the image though, that's where it could become problematic. If you have a really dark image with a lot of black area, meaning area that has no detail in it at all, the printer is going to have to lay down a lot of black ink. And ink and depending on the paper the ink and the printer it may not be laid down very evenly so typically you would like to avoid that situation if at all possible and similarly if you have a lot of the image that is white what will happen is no ink will get put down there so if you're using a certain type of paper let's say that has a very high gloss when it gets printed in an area near the part that is absolutely white is just a little bit shaded gray. Let's say it's zone nine. That will get a little bit of ink put on it, whereas the part that is zone 10 has no ink on it at all. And it will look weird. It will look like part of the image is gloss or it lost its gloss or another part of the image is glossier than something right next to it. So it looks a little odd. So you'd like to avoid that. So what you could do is you could use the zone mapping tools in SilverFX Pro 2 to help you fix it. Now, let's assume that I want to print this and I really don't want this white area in there. As I hover over, again, the histogram and I hover over 10, you can see I'm getting some diagonal lines there. Now, if I click on 10, it will keep them there. Now, you can see I have these lines here. That means when I print this, no ink is going to get put down in these areas. And it may look weird. It look like I have like a hole in the paper or something like that. So I want to get rid of it. I have some lines here, 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 some over here, some over here and over here. So it's not a lot. If this was for uh, just being shared online, I wouldn't even worry about it. I like it as it is, but I want to get rid of those because I'm printing it. So I'll add a control point. So I'll go over here and I'll click the con add a con control point button. And I'm going to put a control point right here. And I'm going to size it so it's just going to cover this. And I'll put separate control points on the other areas. And what I want to do is I could do one of two things. I could go to this um, Amplify White slider and pull it down. Now this doesn't always work. As you can see there, it's not really working. The way that's more common is you just go to the Brightness slider. And you pull it down until you see the lines are disappearing as I pull it to the left. And I just pull it far enough so that there's no more of those diagonal lines. So again, I'll reset the brightness slider by double clicking on it. So it's reset. Now you could see that we have these lines. I'll go to the slider and I'm just going to pull it down until those slide lines are gone. So took care of this area. I have this little area up here. So I'm just going to duplicate this um, control point by holding all in the alt or option key it's alt if you have a pc option if you have a mac click here and just drag a new one right up there now i'm going to fine tune this one so it matches the area whoops i could do the size there we go but i meant i want to fine tune the brightness so i'm going to reset it and then i'm going to pull it down so it matches that area perfectly now i have some areas down here and i'll do that i'll hold the alt or option key and I'll pull down over there. And maybe I'll make this one just a little bigger so it covers a little more. And um, you can see even with it applied, I'm still getting a little bit of the lines there. So I have to pull the brightness down a little bit further on this one. And that got rid of the lines there. Now I got rid of them over here too. So I think we're actually good to go. I don't see any other lines that indicate to me that the highlights are total oh, right here. How'd I miss that one? So we'll duplicate this. I'll hold the Alter Option key in again and drag it over there. I'll make this a little smaller. And I really can't. There's a line right under there. Yeah. Good. Did good. So I think I got rid of them all. Now you could go through again and um, let's say we don't want to crush the blacks. There's not a lot, but we'll click on the zero and you can see the blacks shows those lines there now personally i like or at least my style or my preferred way of processing my images i like the little bit of blacks to be crushed usually on a landscape image and this to me is a little bit to me that adds visual depth to the image it adds tonal range so we're going all the way from zero to 
you know, almost 10. And that to me works. Um, you may not feel the same way. If you didn't, you would just grab a control point, put it over there. In this case here, you could go down again to the um, amplify blacks and you could try pulling that up or down. I'm sorry, that always works backwards, but that doesn't always work. You usually have to go to brightness and pull brightness to the right. Basically, you're making that area brighter. Now, personally, I don't like that. To me, that's adding, it's making it flat. So um, I really don't like that. So I'm going to delete that control point. But that is the idea of what you would do. Now we're done. I'm going to say this image is done. It's still probably a little bit too much structure for me. I'm going to go down and turn off zero by clicking on it. And you could have more of more than one of these on at a time. You could click like four, you know, a bunch of and turn them all on if you'd like. Uh, so you could see various parts of the image. Um, but in this case, let's say the, the, the uh, image is done. I'm going to click OK. And it's going to save the image. And when it goes back into Photoshop, you'll see now that it's a smart filter. And the advantage of having the smart filter, uh, twofold. You're going to have a mask there. So you'll be able to mask out parts of the adjustment if you want. And right here we have this smart ma filter mask. So if I clicked on this mask, right here and I got a brush and because it's white if I paint it in black with the brush use black and I paint on it you can see how we're bringing back the color if I wanted to but I don't want to so I'm gonna undo that by hitting command Z and be control Z if you had a PC now kinda cool right well let's say uh, you know, that structure, it is a little bit too much structure for me. I want to soften it a little bit. You could go back into Silver Effects Pro 2. Just double click right where it says Layer 0. Or right where it says, I'm sorry, Silver Effects Pro 2. Right there. Just double click there. And what it will do is it will reopen the image in Silver Effects Pro 2. And once it does, I could come in and readjust anything. I could even pick a whole new preset over here if I want. You see, it's telling me that we're again, it's an active layer, it's a smart object. That's cool. You can see our control points are still there. Every control point I put is there. But I could come up here to global adjustments, and I just think that my structure is a little bit too heavy in the midtones. And I'll pull that down. Maybe the master. There, that a little bit better for my taste. Then I could come down and click OK. And again, it's going to go open, reopen in Photoshop. And I could come back into Silver Effects Pro 2 and readjust anything as many times as I want. Because we converted the background layer, it happened to be a background layer, any layer you're on, into a smart object. And there you are. There's before. Well, there's not before because I didn't, I didn't duplicate the layer. I should have. And then we would have had a before or after, but I should have done that. So um, that's something to remember is whenever you send anything over into a uh, any plugin, it's always good practice to duplicate the layer and send the duplicated layer into the plugin. That way, if I didn't like this, I could just delete it and we're right back where we started. But this is it. I think it looks pretty decent, and that's the idea. And I hope that made sense about the zone system. I'm sorry I was so wordy about it for those of you that are familiar with the zone mapping system, but it's something that's not used quite as much uh, nowadays because even in film photography, the the film has improved greatly from like 1940 uh, to now. So it's there's a lot more exposure latitude in film. So usually, and metering in even the you know, the older film cameras, the film cameras made in like 1985, the metering is a lot better. So it could nail focus, or I'm sorry, nail exposure much better for the scene. And of course, with digital photography, it's uh, so much exposure latitude in the newer cameras. It's the zone mapping system, something you really don't have to worry about either. So in our next episode, I'm going to do one more video on Silver Effects Pro 2 because I want to better explain that brush that will be available when you're using Photoshop and you're just sending a non-smart object layer into Silver Effects Pro 2. Thank you, everyone that watches my videos. 
I truly do appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon.